dear students i believe all of you are preparing for your interview programs well we have started one series where i would like to answer certain questions which are asked either in the upsc interview or in mock interviews with respect to primarily international relations and uh, political issues and i hope this session will help you in framing the answers in the perspective again i would like to tell you don't think it is a question and answer session it is a conversation session and you should be more confident in telling what your views are rather than having this concern whether my answer is right or wrong so in interview session you should be very uh, mentally in a pleasant state nothing should revolve in your back of the mind uh, be present there both mentally physically and my suggestion is just enjoy the process and uh, i can say that in comparison to mock interviews your environment in the upsc interview is going to be more relaxed yes so now one of the student will be asking some of the questions and i would like to tell you how we can answer according to my point of view yes you can start ma'am so the first question is do you agree banning caste system in india by law so the question is banning caste system in india by law so first of all the idea is not banning the caste system but banning the untouchability and untouchability is already an offense caste system in terms of banning is not possible because our constitution takes caste as a principal basis for the public policy for the social justice program we uh, see the backwardness in terms of caste so caste is mentioned in the constitution itself in the articles especially with respect to affirmative action policy so i think we should uh, not be thinking in that lines rather we have to see caste as a system of stratification and a basis for public policy okay ma'am ma'am should india recognize taliban should india recognize taliban or not so we can wait and we can watch because india should not be the first country to recognize taliban because that will dilute our stand on counter ter on terrorism and in case other countries are recognizing of course we can follow the suit but we have already started some type of interaction providing humanitarian aid to taliban so at least this time our approach is different from that was in 90s when we have completely uh, stopped the relation so let us not be the first one and two philosophies of gandhi ji that you don't agree with two philosophies of gandhi that you don't agree so it will be difficult but one thing we can say gandhi's uh, position on varna system where gandhi took a very idealistic view that varna is a division of labor and not a division of caste because he wanted to justify the indian tradition so uh, first of all like ambedkar maybe that can be one point of view now the second thing is uh, gandhi's uh, approach that uh, a non violence can also be applied in external sphere i believe that uh, it will be too risky to go for a very non violent pacific approach as far as international relations is concerned because our experience has been bad even with uh, the international law based uh, approach so maybe uh, i would not uh, dare to take these two decisions am is gandhi an economic model practical is gandhi's economic model practical i will say yes why not where there is a will there is a way 
uh, whenever some model fail, it is not because there is a problem in the model. There is always a problem in the implementation. If there will be uh, adequate political will, Gandhi's model has chance of success. What exactly is Gandhi's model? The Gandhi's model is going for self-help. So in the present time, we see that uh, the non-governmental sector is increasing. We are already in that particular direction. Gandhi's model is what? Inclusive growth, taking the stakeholders approach. This is already there and uh, we have to show the political will and uh, we have to work out the implementation strategies uh, as far as uh, should it be implemented yes because that is the approach for inclusive growth and sustainable development okay ma'am and best political thinker who are the best political thinkers and why as per you the best political thinker and why uh, i will say that first of all js mill because uh, J.S. Mill's theory is very important from the perspective of democracy and uh, he has been the champion of freedom of speech and expression because uh, with freedom of speech and expression, I believe one of the strongest right a person can have because that is also a key to good governance as well as key to the personal growth. And of course, uh, he is one of the earliest philosophers who talked about the necessity of uh, ending the subjugation of women. Now, as far as the second philosopher, I will say Gramsci, because Gramsci's concept of hegemony, it help us to deconstruct the world, to understand uh, many things, how power is being exercised, how uh, the forms of power are changed. Gramsci has huge importance in academic sense because uh, many thinking like postmodernism, etc., developed out of it. So maybe Gramsci is the second person. Um, actions of India that has led to loss of trust among the neighbors. Actions of India that has led to the loss of trust. I think, uh, first of all, it's not that it's a loss of trust uh, completely. We are doing uh, many productive and cooperative functions with almost all the neighbors under our Sagar and neighborhood first policy. But yes, there are certain actions which have been narrated or which have been projected as a big brotherly attitude. For example, India's stand has been seen or uh, uh, it has been uh, projected by the anti-India elements in different parties uh, on water issue like Tista water issue or in case of uh, resolution of the boundary disputes. And sometimes uh, India's actions, whether it is willing with willingness or formally or informally uh, like blockade, etc., where uh, whether we have done it or not because government has officially held that there is no blockade but this impression has been created so i can say more than the action sometimes uh, the perception we have not been able to set and uh, that was our weakness the importance of neighborhood importance of neighborhood uh, of course uh, it is believed that uh, the biggest challenge for any foreign policy is neighborhood because they are our neighbors and uh, in an increasingly interconnected world obviously neighbors matter and uh, if we look from the perspective of security the major threat can arise from the border if we look from the perspective of uh, prosperity so neighbors are the first market first sources of revenue and uh, also in terms of security, if I talk about, then uh, suppose those who are anti-national elements, it can offer uh, easy escape for them. So, of course, uh, the conventional wisdom in foreign policy is that your foreign policy and how well it is performing is tested by your neighbor. And that's why officially also government of India has the policy called as neighborhood first. Then what is mean by a, meant by a Hindu state or a Hindu nation? Are we moving towards being a Hindu state or a nation? What is meant by Hindu state or a Hindu nation? So if you talk about Hindu state or a Hindu nation, it, is, it can be something like 
a state which is based on religion but at the same time it is a big matter of debate exactly what exactly is hindu because if we go by the verdict of supreme court hinduism is not a way of life but if you talk about hindu state suppose uh, nepal once was considered as a hindu state or sri lanka as a buddhist state means guided by the uh, principles of a particular religion if we take hinduism in terms of religion now the question is india moving towards the hindu state i will say no because our constitution remains intact our judiciary ensures that no government action goes against the basic structure of the constitution so we don't see india is moving towards the hindu state it is uh, basically the constitutional foundations that remain intact and uh, again it is all about creating a narrative but our credentials our basic structure our constitutional values they remain as it used to be i don't find any difference coming and what is akhand bharat akhand bharat is a imaginary concept and uh, it is believed that india had uh, once the influence beyond the region which we call it as india today so akhand bharat basically represent india as a civilizational state everybody knows that india's culture and india's civilization was far and wide whether we talk about southeast asia whether we talk about afghanistan so when you talk about akhand bharat it means a cosmopolitan civilizational state and india's influence should not remain limited to its territorial boundaries we can also see in terms of expansion of common market if something like sark becomes successful that can also be a way to understand akhand bharat and why iran supports militias iran supports militia because if you see uh, who goes for uh, the proxy wars or low intensity warfare the party which is weaker in the conflict so if us is the enemy if israel is a enemy which has advantage in military and other uh, military and other terms of course uh, the option for any state available will be to go for the proxy wars and that this is what the strategy of uh, uh, iran is am iran bond pakistan citing its acting as a host to military militant organizations should we also do it in pakistan or china uh targeting the military uh, uh targeting the terrorist heaven is uh, terrorist heavens but we cannot go outrightly until and unless uh some terrorist attack happens and uh, whenever we do any action we have done surgical strike we have gone for balakot strike we have taken the targeted action and so if we take such action before any action what is important is establishing the righteousness of your action uh, international community should see it right so uh, what machiavelli says that prince knows the movement so if the it is a demand of movement if it is a matter of national interest like it happened in case of uri or it came happened in case of pulwama obviously we can go for such type of targeted actions okay ma'am and the last question what should be india's foreign policy for pakistan india's foreign policy for pakistan we should think in a different approaches means we should have something in a immediate term we should have something in a long term medium term fine so let us categorize so in immediate terms what we want to prevent the terrorist attacks from pakistan and to ensure that the insurgency in kashmir is contained this should be our immediate aim at the same time uh, in medium terms we should try to normalize the relations so that there are certain 
areas where some form of uh, reconciliation or some form of resolution is possible like on Sir Creek, like uh, some type of uh, agreement in case of uh, Siachen or uh, certain low hanging areas or which we called as doable issues. This is this can be done in a long term, in a medium term. As far as the long term is concerned, obviously we will uh, prefer a peaceful South Asia and uh, here I would like to talk about or mention uh, Prime Minister, former Prime Minister Manmohan Singh's approach that uh, we should think of a day where we can have uh, breakfast in Kabul, lunch in Lahore and dinner in Delhi, uh, integrated and peaceful South Asia and I believe that our people certainly deserve it. Thank you ma'am. Okay, so I hope this discussion will give you some food for thought and in the coming days uh, I will be coming up with some more answers which will give you a perspective to handle the situation. Thank you. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.